we'll, we'll give it about another minute uh, before we get started. One, I uh, obviously want to thank you all for coming um, out here today. Um, you can sit right there. No one likes that. Um, we have um, a couple seats um, up front if people want to come down here. This is great. Um, so in an interest of, of, of time, um, I think we want to get things kicked off. Um, again, I'm absolutely happy that you're here, uh, particularly on a, on a Monday when I know it's um, ridiculously hot outside and around Chicago that doesn't happen often, so I know where you could be. Um, Again, this is an effort, and as many of you know, to, uh, um, again, coalesce the energies around the Cancer Center. We've been fairly unapologetic about bringing together the discoveries of sciences and the implementation sciences. And this is, again, another example about how, again, in both our camps, both discovery and in both in implementation, there is some interest around um, cervical cancer in particular. Um, I was uh, uh, told to try to keep the next um, person. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Lowy Short, but I, you know I don't know how I'm going to do that. So I'm going to struggle through how to keep it short uh, when you actually have someone that's been in the field that has impacted, particularly cervical cancer, in a way that he has. Um, it's an exciting day. I mean, I can't lie today that um, this is an exciting day for us, for us as a cancer center. Um, it's an exciting day in the context of the, of the topic. Uh, many of you know that we've made some progress, obviously, within um, Chicago and Illinois with cervical cancers, and yet we still actually have um, areas in town, uh, particularly like Humboldt Park, uh, that are uh, racked with not only cervical incidences, but also cervical deaths. And so bringing our attention around this important issue is going to be important. Dr. Lurie has been a cancer researcher for more than 40 years. He received the National uh, Medal of Technology and Innovations from President Barack Obama in 2014. I know what that means in Chicago. Don't hold back. <laughs> um, for his research in HPV vaccine, as the chief of uh, laboratory uh, cellular oncology at the NCI Cancer Center for Research, uh, Dr. Lowry's research includes uh, the biology of papillomavirus, virus, the regulation of normal neoplastic, um, and he has done outstanding work uh, with, uh, in combination with Dr. Uh, Schiller as well. Um, the interesting thing is that not only um, is he a member of the National Academy of Science, um, but he's received numerous awards, and we mean numerous awards, for his pioneering work in this field. The interesting thing is that, and we can talk about I mean, a lot of amazing things that be in the National Medal, um, the uh, Albert B. Sabin Gold Medal Award, I mean, a huge Alaska Baby Clinical Medical Research Award. But the thing that I'm most struck with Dr. Lowy has really been his commitment to driving science and how that science actually benefits people. In fact, I think you may not remember, but one of the first inter uh, introductions I actually had with Dr. Lowy was uh, interesting there. There was Ned Sharp was him and myself and, and one or two other people around. And we got on the issue of health disparities. And I don't think that, you know, believe it or not, I can be quiet sometimes. <laughs> it's true. And so sometimes when you hear great discussions going around, you, you really want to more pay attention than anything else. And in that conversation, it was quite clear that it's not just about the science, it's about the science, how it brings forth new knowledge, and how it benefits mankind. And to have people from the NIH, particularly with his stature and what he's accomplished, take the time to sort of think about these efforts and how they impact health disparities really impressed upon me um, more than just how much I was in awe of his research, but how much I was in awe of him just as a, a physician scientist. In that context, I know I'm supposed to keep it short, but I have to say, he is from New York School of Medicine. That's where he got his medical degree from. Shout outs to New York and Chicago. <laughs> we love both pizzas. <laughs> and he trained in internal medicine at Stanford University and in dermatology at Yale. I think um, before I get started, I'd like to also um, 
just really thank not only you, thank my senior staff, um, Benta, Marge, and everybody else for organizing this and getting us together. I'd also like to thank all the, uh, um, the senior uh, associate directors from the Cancer Center for helping us to sort of organize and put this together as well, as well as my directors and everyone else. So without further ado, I'm being given the eye. That means to stop, um, and I will, and the next voice you'll hear from is Dr. Logan. Thank you. Thanks, so well, good afternoon. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I really uh, appreciate <coughs> Dr. Wynn inviting me. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, this afternoon sort of the story about uh, HPV, uh, the vaccine, but also be talking about screening uh, as well. Uh, th this is, as Dr. Wynn mentioned, this is an area of cancer research that has both uh, implications in the United States as well as, uh, as, well as globally. Uh, I, I have uh, disclosures. Uh, I'm uh, an inventor of the technology underlying the HPV vaccine. It's been licensed to the two uh, companies that manufacture uh, the, the vaccines. And I will briefly discuss potential off-label uses of the FDA-approved vaccines protecting against HPV-positive oropharynx cancer and also fewer vaccine doses. Uh, and I am involved in other technologies that have been licensed uh, uh, as, as well, but are not directly related to the presentations. So I'm going to talk with you really about three areas and a little bit uh, also about uh, screening. Cancers induced by HPV infection, then focusing on the vaccines after we talk a little bit about uh, screening, and then new research to evaluate the efficacy of a single vaccine dose. The epidemiology of the HPV-associated cancers, it really depends on where you live. And the next few slides will essentially document that. This slide shows you that in the more developed regions of the world, cervical cancer mortality is relatively, uh, is, is relatively uncommon. Most women who develop cervical cancer don't die of it, although certainly some do. And uh, what you can see on the, uh, upper, on the upper part here, that in uh, the purple, the, uh, the majority of women who die from cervical cancer are women in less developed regions of the world, low and middle income countries. And over the next 15 years, the expectation is that the number of women dying from cervical cancer in low and middle income countries will essentially go up by about 40% for zero. And in the developing world uh, of HPV associated cancer, uh, cervical cancer represents about 90% uh, of, uh, of, of this. This slide, if you'll first look on the left side here, this shows you uh, how different uh, cervical cancer is in different parts of the world. On the bottom <coughs> is shown what happens in high-income countries such as the United States. And you can appreciate that the blue, which represents incidence, is much smaller than up here, which represents different areas of Africa. But in addition, the profile of the percentage that is red down here is much smaller than the profile that is red up here, and that represents mortality. So the majority of women <clears throat> in low and middle income countries, not only do they have a much higher incidence of cancer, but most of them are going to die from their disease in contrast to what happens uh, in the United States and other, and other places. And I show this on, on this side here, uh, on the right side, just to show you. In 1950, we were a high incidence country. It's really because of the pap smear and follow up that we have become a low incidence country. It has zero to do with the HPV, uh, with the HPV vaccine. This shows you what the profile is in the United States of HPV-associated cancer. And first, if you look down, if you look down here, you want to see that in the United States, about 40% of 
HPV-associated cancer occurs in men, 60% in women. In uh, the developing world, it's around 95% in women and only 5% in men because cervical cancer so do, uh, d dominates. By the way, anyone who wants my slides, uh, they're, they're here and just, uh, just ask for them. Uh, and they're about a little over 30,000 cases per year. Then if we turn to the upper part, uh, <coughs> cervical cancer, 100% uh, is positive. These other cancers, so-called non-cervical cancers, the majority of them are attributable to HPV infection, but uh, there are some of those cancers that are not attributable to HPV infection. But these non-cervical cancers actually represent more uh, cancer than cervical cancer, although economically we s devote far more resources to cervical cancer than to the other cancers, but the majority of those resources are for cervical cancer screening and follow-up, not for the treatment uh, of, dis uh, of disease. And then, uh, as most of you are aware, uh, oropharynx cancer, about three quarters is in men and a quarter uh, and a quarter in women, and the rate has been going up substantially uh, in, in over a recent 25 year period, more than a threefold uh, increase in that rate. So when it comes to cervical cancer, we have really two opportunities for prevention. One is primary prevention by vaccination, and the other is secondary prevention by screening. And the natural history of HPV infection and cervical cancer is universal. It's the same in high resource settings and low resource settings. If you first look in green, what you can appreciate is that when women become sexually active very soon after that, they are very likely to become HPV infected. Uh, for a woman who has one lifetime sexual partner, uh, in the first two years of being sexually active, she is <clears throat> likely to, uh, she, she about 40% uh, HP, uh, HPV infection. This, this. <laughs> I want my time back. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, and, and, and so what, what you can appreciate here in the green uh, is that most infections, luckily, are self-limited. When the infection goes away, so does the risk for developing uh, serious uh, disease. But s some of the, uh, sorry, just, excuse me. Uh, But uh, this is for dysplasia in blue, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is really to identify people who have prevalent infection and have dysplasia, and you can uh, do that. And then in red is the women who are not uh, successfully protected, either by primary or secondary screening, or by their own uh, immune system, uh, and, and so they develop, uh, they, they develop cervical cancer. Now, it's been a very long road uh, in the United States, but this slide really shows you how, in 1975, the incidence of cervical cancer among African American <coughs> women was about twice as high as among uh, 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 Caucasian women. But now, finally, after many, many years, the incidence is very similar. But if you turn your attention to the right side, you will see that the mortality rate uh, among uh, black women is about 50% higher than among white women. And the main reason probably is because when they are diagnosed, a higher percentage of them are diagnosed with uh, advanced disease as opposed to <clears throat> as opposed to early stage disease. So there are a lot of things to be done with screening, and I have a, uh, about uh, five slides to show you about uh, what is happening with research in screening at the t at this time. First, in 2014, HPV uh, detection 
became approved by the FDA as a primary screen. It can either be cytology, that is pap smear screening, or uh, HPV. But over the next few years, primary screening is going to become progressively more HPV-based and less cytology-based because the prevalence of uh, the HPV types that are, tend to be detected by pap smear screening are basically going to become lower uh, as a result of vaccination. The Prevention Services Task Force recommendations, uh, HPV-based testing every five years, uh, women 30 or over, uh, and cytology for women who are 21 or older. But importantly, moving to HPV-based screening, many patients who have HPV infection don't need to be treated because they don't have moderate or high-grade dysplasia. And therefore, ancillary testing becomes critical for uh, deciding how these patients should be managed. And a very big area of research right now is developing a number of different approaches for so-called triage testing. And I'm just showing you one uh, approach which is using viral DNA methylation, uh, which uh, really was a basic science observation uh, made by colleagues at the National Cancer Institute in collaboration with colleagues at Albert Einstein School of uh, Medicine in New York a number of years ago. And now colleagues at NCI are trying to develop this into what they hope will eventually be an FDA-approved test. And so this is really to so show you an interim uh, 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 status where in white are the women who, uh, who are HPV positive with different HPV types, and they don't have methylation. And here are in black are the women who, ha uh, who have methylation. And this dotted line is the threshold for referring to colposcopy. And for most of the HPV types, the methylation actually is a pretty good discriminator uh, between those women who need to go to a colposcopy and those who don't. And importantly, uh, this approach and others are going to be studied for self-collected specimens. My own feeling is that we need to rely on technology for trying to help to overcome some disparities. So for example, the uh, mortality disparity that I showed you earlier with cervical cancer, if it were possible for uh, women to do self-sampling, uh, so, uh, it would just be that much easier to get uh, a, a testing. But it's important, I think, for them not just to get an HPV test, but also a linked uh, triage test so you know what needs to be done. I want to show you just two slides of something that I think is going to be more applicable in the developing world than in <clears throat> the, uh, than in the U.S., but it really is a remarkable uh, r result that was published in January uh, this year. Uh, it, the uh, World Health Organization approves and recommends uh, a procedure, uh, a low-tech procedure that's uh, called VIA or visualization of the cervix with acetic acid. But although it is uh, WHO approved, it's actually a very poor test. It uh, has, uh, uh, the problem is it has a lot of false negatives, a lot of false positives. And when it works, although it was thought that it was going to work kind of like a visual pap smear, so it would identify precancer, it actually identifies early invasive cancer. And there aren't enough resources and infrastructure in low and middle income countries if you have everybody being diagnosed with invasive cancer. There just aren't the resources to be able to treat that. It's far preferable to treat dysplasia, which is so much easier uh, to treat. But look at, but, but uh, colleagues uh, at, the NC, at the NCI 
uh, Mark Schiffman and Nico Van Benson, worked together with a group at the National Library of Medicine, with colleagues in uh, Costa Rica, where we've been doing a lot of research over the last more than 30 years on uh, HPV infection and cervical cancer, and also a, a group called Global Good that is supported by uh, Bill Gates. Uh, and basically, uh, the take-home message is over here. Machine learning <clears throat> and artificial intelligence from digitized images called automated cervical evaluation, or AVE, can greatly increase the ability of this approach to develop cervical precancer. So the computer sees things that we don't. And uh, so Unitaid, which is uh, a philanthropic uh, organization based in Geneva, is supporting research to uh, essentially see if this approach can be developed and FDA approved. The idea would be that eventually a smartphone would have all of the algorithms, et cetera. So you would take a photograph of, uh, of the patient, and within seconds, you would know whether the patient needed to be treated, didn't need to be treated, uh, et cetera. This is research. This is not yet uh, FDA approved. So I just want to give you, I hope you got a flavor for, there's a lot of things going on with uh, cervical cancer screening. I think five or six years from now, it's going to be quite different in terms of what's FDA approved and what the management is going to be. So <clears throat> HPV vaccines, uh, as Dr. Wynn mentioned, uh, I've worked very closely with uh, John Schiller for much longer than either of us would like to remember. It's more than 30 years. Uh, and uh, we've had terrific people in the laboratory uh, uh, working with us, and also fantastic group of people both at, at NCI as well as extramurally and internationally. And I just want to point out that Reinhard Kernbauer, uh, who is a dermatologist at the University of Vienna in Austria, he's the one who really developed the technology when he was a fellow uh, in the lab that underlies the vaccine. So the key issues for vaccine development was that first there was no precedent for a successful vaccine against a local sexually transmitted infection. Protective immunity is thought to be attributable to neutralizing <coughs> antibodies, and that's true here uh, with this vaccine. But it wasn't clear how to make a vaccine that would induce high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And the solution that we found was what we call virus-like particles. And I'll show you a picture on the next slide. And they're composed of the main protein that makes the outer shell of the virus. And uh, this uh, protein is called L1. Uh, that's not Spanish. It's a letter L. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, and L1 contains the immunodominant neutralization uh, epitopes. Uh, it, so the, uh, the way that Reinhardt did things was to put it in a recombinant baculovirus, infect insect cells, and this led to self-assemble of virus-like particles. And they're, sh and, and they're shown here. They induce very high titers of virion neutralizing antibodies. It's non-infectious and it's non-oncogenic. And uh, GlaxoSmithKline essentially makes their commercial version of the vaccine identically to the way that, uh, the, to the way that Reinhard uh, made it. So I just want to uh, point out that the disease prevention goals, from my perspective, uh, for vaccination is different in less developed countries and more developed countries, in part because of what kind of cancers you need to worry about, and also because of resources. In less developed countries, it's mainly to protect against cervical cancer because cervical cancer so predominates as the HPV-associated cancer, and so female vaccination is most cost-effective. In more developed countries, it really is to protect both males and females against this wide range of HPV-associated cancer. Female vaccination with high uptake is most cost effective, but adding vaccination to males can confer even greater protection for vaccinees uh, than can herd immunity alone. And very importantly, uh, 
that male vaccination is by far the fastest way to reduce HPV prevalence in men who have sex with men. If you are only going to vaccinate women, it's very, it, it will take a very long time before you could remove, if you will, that, uh, that reservoir. For a vaccine, it's really important uh, to uh, be concerned about safety. The people that are going to be vaccinated are normal or normal people. And so <clears throat> uh, many groups have looked at this. Uh, and this is from a review from uh, 2016 uh, from the CDC, no confirmed safety signals identified. Uh, and there was a more recent review from people in Australia, similar conclusions. This slide summarizes for you the pivotal phase three trials that were conducted by the three different uh, HPV vaccines that eventually were uh, FDA approved. Uh, Gardasil, the quadrivalent vaccine made by Merck, first generation vaccine. Uh, Cervix, the bivalent vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline. And then the second generation vaccine, the non-avalent vaccine, Gardasil 9, uh, made by Merck. If you first look over here on the right, uh, what I hope you can appreciate is the protection is very high, over 95%. And who are, are the women who are in the, who are this? This is women with no genital infection detected at the start of the trial. They are the most comparable to the target group that we are trying to vaccinate uh, uh, adolescents who have not yet become sexually uh, active. They're, uh, uh, of course, virus negative. And the, uh, and the clinical endpoint was precancer for all three vaccines and for, the, uh, for Gardasil also for genital warts. And so it's just as protective against uh, genital warts as for a cervical infection. That's not true of the bivalent vaccine because it doesn't target HPV 6 and uh, 6 and 11. Uh, the bivalent vaccine just is 16 and 18, so it's really a cancer prevention vaccine, whereas the Merck vaccines have 6 and 11, which uh, together are responsible for about 90% of uh, genital warts. This slide summarizes for you the different HPV types and their relative contribution to cervical cancer. The non-cervical cancers are really dominated primarily by HPV-16, a much higher percentage, but between the two, about 70% worldwide, and there the HPV types are in the first generation vaccines. Neither vaccine is sold in the <coughs> United States. Gardasil 9, which is the only vaccine sold in the United States now, added five more HPV types and uh, it, in principle can protect against almost about 90% of potentially oncogenic uh, HPV infections. But I just want to point out that there are a few HPV types that are responsible for a limited number of uh, cancers that are not protected uh, by the vaccine. This slide uh, shows you that the value of the second generation vaccine, Gardasil 9, really is greater for African American women and for uh, Hispanic women than for white women. Uh, and that's because paradoxically the uh, first generation vaccines were more beneficial for Caucasian women when we talk about cervical cancer. That's here on the upper part. Uh, there's <clears throat> cervical cancer, the, the results are indistinguishable for white, black, or Hispanics. But for precancer, what I hope you can appreciate, if you just look at 16 and 18, whereas two thirds of precancer uh, in white women are attributable to HPV 16 and 18, less than one third attributable uh, to these in black women and only about half in Hispanics. And therefore, the benefit from adding these five types in terms of precancer, not in terms of uh, cancer, is actually greater for uh, uh, black and Hispanic women than for, than for white 
uh, than for white women. The total is still a little bit higher for Caucasian women uh, compared to black and Hispanic women. This is all data that was developed long after the vaccines were uh, developed uh, and approved. So the goal of HPV vaccination uh, is, of course, to directly reduce the risk of infection and disease in the vaccines, <coughs> but uh, the, the, also to induce herd immunity. And because we have had the unfortunate situation in multiple places in the United States this year of seeing a recrudescence of measles, we all now front and center understand the potential importance of herd uh, immunity. And so the next, uh, th th the next few slides, I'm going to show you evidence of herd immunity in two countries where there's high uptake of the vaccine. And then I'm going to show you where there's less evidence, uh, I'm sorry, evidence of less uh, herd immunity in a country where there was less high uptake. Uh, the less high uptake country was the United States. Uh, let's first start with Australia. This is a super interesting slide because it shows you that for heterosexual men who uh, were not vaccinated but were of uh, the right age group, they started vaccinating in 2007, high uptake in Australia. You can see that uh, men who, who were under 21, dramatic decrease in their uh, incidence of, war, of genital warts. The men were not vaccinated, only the women. If you look by contrast with the interrupted green line, there, uh, there's no statistically significant fall off because these men were basically too old to uh, interact in a major way with the young women who were being vaccinated at that time. And then if you look uh, with the interrupted red line, this is uh, the men 21 to 30, a very similar drop off, but they started from a higher, uh, in, uh, a higher incidence. And again, the p-value uh, is as close to nirvana as you get for biostatistics. <laughs> Uh, so, th this, uh, so, so this is ecological data, and uh, there are prevalence data as well. Uh, this is with Gardasil uh, in Australia. But I also want to show you data in Scotland, where they also have had high uptake. This is with the bivalent vaccine. And, uh, uh, and on the left, what is shown here uh, in blue are the young women who have been vaccinated and the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18. It's done according to cohorts, not uh, that's the birth cohort year. But basically, you can see this downward trend. But what's even more interesting are the women who are in red because they are the unvaccinated women from the same cohort. They come down at a slower rate, but they end up also being down. And so this is direct evidence of herd immunity. I'm not showing you the data, but for the HPV types not protected by the vaccine, no such change. So it's specific to the, vac uh, to the vaccine uh, types. And then in, uh, you can see that again in the, in the green, this is the decrease in cervical dysplasia uh, for women 20 to 24, women 30 to 34, too old to have been vaccinated, no such protection. And now, uh, for the first time, you actually are seeing a dramatic decrease in the incidence of cervical cancer in women who are 20 to 29 in Scotland. No such change in the women who are 30 to 39. So uh, th th I think this is really pretty good. Uh, now, US of A, uh, despite, women, despite winning the Women's World Cup, uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 there's uh, the genital warts trends in men. Uh, I'm showing you the men because to d directly compare it with what you saw a couple of slides ago with the men in, uh, in Australia. And uh, the, the, this green is the men uh, 20 to 24, okay? All of the others are not going down. And we don't, it's unclear how much of this is just, it went up and then it went down, et cetera. 
But there's clear evidence that the vaccine is having an impact. This is genital warts in women. Uh, and now here in red, these are the women 15 to 19. In green, uh, the 20 to 24 year old women and, uh, and others who are of vaccine age, there is a decrease in genital warts. It's just not as much. So this shows you the latest data that we have, which is through the end of 2017 from the, from the CDC. And what is shown here, down here, is the <coughs> uptake over time uh, for women who have had, for, for men and women receiving uh, the HPV vaccine, they're age 13 to, uh, 13 to 17. What I hope you can appreciate that these curves are much higher than these curves. The higher curves are the two other adolescent vaccines, the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis toxin, and the, uh, <clears throat> uh, and the meningococcal uh, vaccine. So HPV is different. We continue to see an upward trend. Th this upper line is one dose, and the lower line is being up to date, whether it's two or three doses, depending on the age and year. And I'm going to show you some data, uh, some, some other data in the table in the next slide. But this slide, I think, is just really tells you a bit about how we don't necessarily go to the areas that require the most, uh, that, that really require the most. If you turn your attention to the right, this is the incidence of HPV-associated cancers. This is, uh, and you can see that the, south, the, the southeast uh, is where the highest incidence of HPV-associated cancers are. But if you now look here, this is percentage of adolescents who are up to date on the vaccine. The dark areas are the areas where there's a higher uptake of the vaccine. The light areas, uh, m uh, many of these southwest, these southeast states uh, have low uh, uptake. And then this table I think is especially instructive for a number of reasons. First, the HPV vaccine is very unusual in that the uptake among children from families below poverty is actually uh, higher than the uptake of uh, ch children from families that are uh, at poverty or above poverty. This is the meningococcal. You'll see that there's no difference uh, in terms of, e uh, from an economic perspective. But in addition, it's really interesting to look at, uh, at Illinois uh, because in Chicago, you have a very high uptake of the HPV vaccine, over 80% at least one dose, whereas the rest of the state, it's uh, below 65%. Uh, and so what happens in Chicago, unfortunately, has stayed in Chicago. Uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, and the uh, so the uh, and and here again, you can see that's not the case for the meningococcal vaccine. And Indiana, as an adjacent state, uh, here high uptake of meningococcal vaccine, low uptake of the HPV uh, vaccine. So there's one more complication with the vaccine, which is a worldwide vaccine shortage that uh, has not been widely publicized in the United States. But these are two uh, things by the, the, the World Health Organization and UNICEF calling attention to it last year. The good news is it's secondary <coughs> to increased demand. This, the bad news is it's going to take many years to overcome it because in order to produce enough, you, you really need to change the manufacturing, how many places there are for manufacturing. So I just have a, a, a sort of an ethical question, not an answer. During this period, should there be policy implications in the industrialized world when considering adding gender neutral vaccination or increasing the age range for recommending vaccination? Because if there are a limited number of doses of vaccine, uh, should we be you know, changing who needs, the, who, who needs the vaccine in a high income country where we have low incidence, relatively speaking, of the cancer? versus a low-income country where there's a high incidence. So 
three slides about mechanism. We've done a lot of research in the lab to look at the mechanism by which the vaccine works, and I'm just summarizing uh, that here. We think that a really key aspect is the repetitive structure of the virus-like particle, that it is intrinsically immunogenic. Uh, in addition, the tissue-associated neutralizing antibodies are actually exudated at potential sites of infection. And I'll show you a model uh, on, uh, of that in two slides. The levels of the exudated antibodies are high in contrast to the low levels that would be in the intact cervical mucosa. They're similar to the serum levels, not the lower levels of the non-disrupted uh, genital tract. And finally, HPV is highly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. And if you want further discussion, last year, uh, John and I wrote a perspective in the uh, journal Vaccine. This reconstruction cryoelectron micrograph shows you in blue a virus particle. And in red, just on one side, is a, a neutralizing monoclonal uh, antibody. And it's, I think, pretty easy to understand how if you have a few antibodies binding to the virus particle, it will interfere with the ability of the virus to bind to its cognate receptors and therefore be difficult for it to initiate, uh, in, uh, initiate infection. In the vast majority of women, uh, the vaccine actually induces sterilizing immunity, which is immunity that you never even get infected. Most vaccines work primarily by preventing disease. They don't actually uh, prevent uh, infection. So this is the model that we uh, have where the Ys here represent the antibody levels, lots of Ys down here in the tissue. You have the stratified squamous epithelium, and then in the mucosa, uh, low levels of antibody. But in order to induce infection, you need to abrogate epithelial integrity because the first step in HPV life cycle is actually binding to the basement membrane uh, that separates the epithelium from the dermis and only after it undergoes a conformational change does the virus actually go to uh, the basal cell where it really uh, be begins its intracellular uh, life cycle. So when you abrogate the, uh, <clears throat> the, the integrity, the antibodies that are in the tissue go up so that when the virus particle comes in, you, it, uh, the antibodies recognize it and they don't bind to the basement membrane uh, and you don't get infection. So the last topic I want to address is really the challenge of global HPV vaccination. You know, we can all get very excited that more than a million girls have uh, <coughs> been vaccinated uh, with the vaccine over the first uh, a little more than 10 years since it was approved. The problem is that less than 5% of eligible girls have been vaccinated in low and middle income countries where about 90% of cervical cancer deaths occur. And worldwide, there are about 60 million girls born annually. So to control cervical cancer worldwide, we probably need to vaccinate 40 to 50 million girls in each birth cohort. And so this is what has led us to wonder about whether a single vaccine dose might confer many years of protection. But of course, we also have some evidence suggesting that this might be the case. All the evidence that we have is post hoc. So it is not sufficient to uh, change standard of care, but we think it's sufficient to warrant a rigorous evaluation of a single dose potential. Uh, from the NCI studies uh, in Costa Rica for the bivalent vaccine and in the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the quadrivalent, that is uh, the uh, Gardasil vaccine uh, in India. So I'm going to show you two pieces of uh, unpublished data just because of the duration. Uh, we, we published uh, data at seven years, but this is now 11 year data. This is showing you the prevalence in women who were in the Costa Rica vaccine trial, uh, they, got the, uh, one, they, they got one, two, or three doses of the bivalent vaccine. 
And uh, the, the, it was intended that all of them would get three, but for a variety of reasons, just as many women in the control group as well as in the vaccinated group uh, only got one or two doses. And if you look here, these are in green are the, is the prevalence of the HPV types not protected by the vaccine. And they're very similar among the groups, whether you got uh, no dose, one dose, two doses, or three doses. By contrast, in orange, you, I hope you can appreciate that the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18 infection is far lower among the women, whether they got one dose, two doses, or three doses, far lower than the women who didn't get uh, the vaccine. And there are three different HPV types, 31, 33, and 35, that are cross-protected by the bivalent vaccine. And again, you see that this strong protection, even with, even with one dose. I should point out that Gardasil 9 includes these three HPV types plus two additional uh, HPV types. The even more remarkable result was uh, w uh, looking uh, at the antibody levels. We're now 11 years out from just getting one dose of the vaccine. There is uh, basically stable antibody levels. And presumably these levels are high enough for, for protection because of the post hoc data that you saw with the efficacy. Of course, they're not as high, the antibody levels, as with two or with uh, three uh, doses. I'm showing you data for 16, but also for HPV 18, the same. So what might account for this? We think that the key is the repetitive structure of the virus-like particle, and that the, uh, and, and basically oligomerization of the B cell receptor by antigen induces long-lived plasma cells. And schematically, that's shown here on the right, where you have strong survival and proliferation signals from the B cells, leading to high levels of antibodies of long duration. On the left is the more typical protein-based vaccine. Think about tetanus toxoid, for example. Uh, they're monomeric uh, complexes. The activation signals are relatively weak, relatively short duration. And so that's why you need to be vaccinated periodically against that. So we have started a randomized controlled trial in Costa Rica to test the efficacy of one dose versus two doses, partial support by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It is a four-arm non-inferiority trial uh, with uh, two different FDA-approved vaccines, one dose versus two doses of Cervix and one versus two doses of Gardasil 9. We need a lot of uh, young women in each arm because of the non-inferiority design. And in addition, we expect there to be very few vaccine failures. And it, we, uh, the primary trial will be four years with longer follow-up. Uh, and again, if you want to know more about it, it's registered at clinicaltrials.gov. And Amy Kramer, who is the uh, principal investigator, uh, did a perspective article uh, last year. So the potential impact of demonstrating one dose can confer strong protection. First, it could change standard of care in the United States and globally. And in the US, it could save more than $300 million each year in vaccine costs. But from a public health point of view, we think it could make it feasible to control the worldwide public health problem of cervical cancer and other HPV-associated cancer. My second to last slide is this. What about, does this have implications for other vaccines? And at least for vaccines attributable to infectious agents, possibly. So there are, uh, using the repetitive structure approach uh, that have been used for BK virus, JC virus, uh, in influenza vaccine, and Epstein-Barr virus. These are all candidate vaccines, uh, not FDA-approved vaccines. And there is every other year now, there, for the last 10 years, there have been uh, a virus particle, virus-like particle and nanoparticle meeting uh, held about that. I have nothing to do with uh, developing that meeting, et cetera. I've actually, actually never been there. Uh, so take home messages. Basic research led to identification of HPV as the cause of several cancers and to development of the vaccines and HPV-based screening. Virus-like particle display is highly immunogenic. The induced antibodies are durable. 
it's probably attributable to long-lived plasma cells induced by the repetitive display of the vaccine and control of HPV-associated cancer as a worldwide public health problem may soon be feasible. Thank you so much for coming. It's really <laughs> terrific. I look forward to your comments and questions. So I think we have a mic on the right and the left. Um, we have roughly about 10 minutes for any questions. So uh, we'll take questions now. Um, there's Dr. Beck. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lurie. Uh, very uh, fascinating uh, presentation. I had a question about HPV screening. A question about HPV screening. Um, maybe I missed it, but what's the percentage of HPV uh, positive women who do or do not get uh, cervix cancer? And could this be related to what you talked about in terms of viral methylation? How, how do you determine who's going to get Sure. Right. So the vast majority of uh, HPV infections that lead to cervical cancer are thought to be acquired before women are 30. Women get infected uh, when they're after they're 30, but most of those infections don't uh, don't lead to cancer. Uh, and the reason that that's uh, and and the the frequency of infection is much higher in women in, in their uh, 20s and late teens than women in their 30s. So it's a problem if you're HPV positive and you're very young. It's a, it's a, it's a, pr a problem. So it's not FDA approved yet to uh, do HPV-based screening in women under 30. But women who are over 30, uh, the older they are, if they're HPV positive, the more likely it is that they are going to have a significant infection. But significant infection means that there is a parameter that uh, beyond being HPV positive, I showed you methylation, which is w one of them. Uh, P16 you know, is uh, a tumor suppressor gene that in many cancers, it's down-regulated, but paradoxically, because of a relationship between uh, P16 RB and HPV 16 and HPV E7, uh, it's actually upregulated in the vast majority of uh, a a infections, and so that could be used as a triage. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question about cross-protection, um, and I realize that in the bivalent vaccine, there's cross-protection with 31, 33, and 35, I believe. Now, in developing the nine-valent vaccine, is there cross-protection for the other subtypes that do not fall under the nine-valent? I, I don't think the data have been published. The thinking would be no, because there's very limited cross-protection with the Merck vaccine, uh, even with, with Gardasil, okay? Uh, and, and so the thinking is that it would be similar for the nine-valent vaccine. It is unclear whether the, the lack of cross, I mean, the easiest way of explaining it is, is that the GSK vaccine is much more immunogenic than the Merck vaccine. They use a proprietary adjuvant, whereas Merck uses uh, a, a standard alum uh, adjuvant. But it's possible that manufacturing differences might, uh, uh, might, might also contribute. I didn't understand the comparison. Well, comparing what and what? Yes. Yes. It's, it's basically that the incidence is, uh, let's say, depending on what country you're in, but, you know, five to ten times higher. So what, uh, the question is, what changes that ratio, men versus women, is so much? They, they just don't have screening. 
I mean, it's just the major difference, you know, in, in the United States, a woman's lifetime risk of developing uh, a genital HPV infection is estimated to be 80%. That's eight zero. So the uh, infection is not more prevalent there. It's just that they don't have the resources for high quality cervical cancer screening, and we're trying to change that. I didn't. So you may want to repeat and hold the mic closely. So how do you trigger the self-assembly of the vaccine in production? Oh, the, the, well, Merck is making three, uh, is going to uh, establish three more vaccine production plants to meet what they assume is going to be really high worldwide demand, but it takes a, a long time from the time you decide to do that until there's, vi uh, you know, there's vile vaccine that you can give to someone. Thank, thank you so much. I was really excited to hear your, the one slide that talked about um, populations that are below the poverty level being actually more compliant. We actually see that here locally within our FQHC population because part of the, what, the thing, the panel, when you have the vaccine conversation, it's not siloing out the HPV vaccine from the MMR vaccine, but it's really having a vaccination conversation. And my question is, are there any efforts by the NCI to really think about encouraging research studies like this to happen in the FQHC setting, particularly around the single dose. We do re really well with getting our patients at first dose, but it's the follow-up where yeah. we struggle. Yeah. So a two-part answer. First, the single dose is not yet FDA approved, so I hope your goal is not to just give one dose, <laughs> or at least no. not while I have the microphone. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and we, uh, we did uh, have uh, a, 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 pro a, a program a, a, a few years ago uh, which was designed to, you know, for special populations to uh, look at implementation research for the vaccine. We don't have a special program right now, but certainly, uh, you know, we welcome, uh, we work, welcome applications. Yes. So we have time for a couple other questions, I believe. No, we have we had question, some right? Okay. Hi, I'm with the American Cancer Society and we're obviously huge supporters of HPV and we have a huge campaign. Um, we are always pushing that, you know, it's amazing that we live in a time where we have a vaccine that can prevent six different types of cancer. We've recently heard, even though it has not been proven, but there's been some evidence that a seventh potential cancer can be prevented with the HPV vaccine, which is squamous cell skin cancer. Have you heard anything about that? Well, <clears throat> uh, skin cancer, uh, the, 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 I, I, would, I would have two uh, comments. First, the role of HPV in skin cancer in people with normal immunity is really pretty controversial. There's a, the data are a little bit better uh, for people who are immunosuppressed. But the bad news is that the HPV types that might be implicated in that situation are not the HPV types that are in the vaccine. So it would be surprising if, there, if you were going to look, see a reduction uh, in, that, in, in that cancer given, uh, given the composition of the vaccine. We've got the last couple, Dr. Prince. There, you, uh, in the data that you showed on Scotland, in the women who had been treated versus untreated, you showed that the untreated women, their incidence started going down. Did I get that correctly? No, these were not treated. These were not women who were treated. These were women who had been vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Well, they, 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 I'm sorry, they, they, what, I apologize. It was a complicated slide that I went over too quickly. The, the left panel was simply prevalence of HPV 16 and 18, comparing women who were vaccinated versus the women of the same age who were not vaccinated. The two other panels are simply looking at cervical dysplasia, all, whoever comes into the clinic. Uh, and, and then the... A decrease in women who are not screened? Oh. Uh, oh, the, 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 in the, the women, 
the, the women who are not vaccinated, the prevalence of the HPV types has gone down dramatically in, uh, in Scotland among young women. That's not going to be the case for older women because that age group hasn't been, if you will, exposed to the vaccine. But that's, this is, this is uh, evidence of herd immunity. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think it's on. Yeah. Now it's on. No, it's on. Uh, since you are the director of NCI, I would ask you a policy question. Last, <laughs> if, if you can, in addition to vaccination, is there any effort by NCI to go for therapeutics as a normal molecule with the technology for therapeutics? Is it in addition to vaccination? You mean, you mean for HPV? Uh -huh. Oh. Uh, yes, we we uh, supp we support we, we we support research on therapeutic vaccination, and we also support research uh, with small molecule uh, inhibitors. Yes. What percentage what, vaccination? What percentage funding? Funding. funding? Uh, it, the, the percentage of funding the, the percentage of funding is smaller uh, because it, it, neither of those. Uh, is uh, is as far is as far advanced. Yes, yes. I think. Do you yeah. want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, you I might want to stand up <laughs> so people know. <laughs> Breast cancer task force. I'm just saying. <laughs> Soon to be a new name. <laughs> um, I'm Anne Marie Murphy, and I run the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force, which actually are changing our name soon to Equal Hope because we are launching a cervical cancer initiative for disparities. And we, when we do outreach, we get every question conceivable, as you can imagine. And I wondered, what is your quickest answer in regards to those that are a little older, not the 11 to 12 year olds, but the 15 and on, in regards to any data in regards to pregnancy, potential pregnancy, and side effects? I believe the answer there were, there's no, no Ah, OK. Effects. So we, uh, first of all, the vaccine is not approved for use during pregnancy and it should not be used during pregnancy. But uh, there were quite a few women, uh, I mean, we, we basically looked in collaboration with GlaxoSmithKline uh, at women in their international trials as well as women in our, uh, in the Costa Rica trials. We, we couldn't see any problem, okay? And w uh, with the Merck trials, there was a signal uh, and it wasn't at all clear whether that uh, signal was coincidental or causal. I don't think that the post-licensure studies uh, that Merck have done has has uh, has done has supported the notion that there is a problem. But you know, it's much harder to study that in the context uh, of post-licensure than it is to do it uh, than it is to do it in the context of randomized controlled trials. The absolute. Last two questions are on the left, and there will be no more. Uh, hi, um, I have a quick question. I'm not sure if there's an uh, answer for it, which is that you know, it's, it's obvious from your side where the vaccination of the occurring and where it's not occurring. And for example, you give an example of uh, Indiana versus Illinois. And so, how do you solve that problem? Because it seems to me that's you mean how how to get it to how to get it in the US or get it in in the US well uh, there there is uh, there, there there is a nationwide uh, 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 HPV vaccine roundtable that meets uh, every year uh, and uh, that's uh, supported by the CDC. Uh, and th th that question is really front and center uh, all the time. I, in some ways, uh, I think cancer centers may be pretty e effective. Uh, North Carolina is, a, I think, a case in point where their incidence of HPV-associated cancer is very high. But the cancer centers, the three uh, NCI-designated cancer centers in North Carolina have made a major effort statewide to try to promote vaccination. And I, I, so I think, that, uh, I think that is a factor, although I'm sure there are other factors as well. Last question. 
So this <coughs> vaccine is against HIV, but really it's against cervical cancer. Do you know any other cancer that could be treated or used some vaccine? Well, the hepatitis B virus uh, vaccine is uh, designed to uh, re reduce uh, the risk and incidence of uh, liver cancer, and it's, uh, the data from Taiwan are really pretty impressive. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, and there are candidate vaccines for Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, there was a, uh, GlaxoSmithKline made a uh, single component uh, vaccine called GP350, which is one of the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, glycoproteins uh, of, the vi of the virus. And they used uh, infectious mononucleosis as the endpoint. There actually was a 70% decrease in the incidence of mononucleosis in their phase two trial. But they decided that it was not good enough to go forward with further clinical development. But investigators, particularly uh, in, in the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, are making a uh, multi-component vaccine uh, using repetitive display, but they're using ferritin instead of uh, a true virus-like particle display. And they're getting uh, antibody levels that are about two orders of magnitude higher than with the soluble GP350. I want to thank you guys again. Uh, appreciate it. We'll see you again. Thank you.